Good evening and welcome to the Marian Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Sarah Sanbar and I'm one of the fellows here. It is a telling fact about American society that the very affirmation Black Lives Matter is a radical political act. Black bodies have been abused, oppressed, and fetishized since they were forcibly brought to America's shores in order to build a country. I feel comfortable saying that racism is a systemic problem that trickles down into every aspect of life, be it in the form of interpersonal microaggressions or police brutality. I feel comfortable saying this because I believe it to be true. This makes it very easy to forget that for a significant portion of American society, I am wrong, offensive, and my words stir up racial tensions that they believe do not exist. Joining us tonight is Heather McDonald, a woman who presents a viewpoint that is not often heard on these campuses, contending that the central Black Lives Matter narrative is not just false, but dangerous, and that her data counters the movement's arguments, and her data counters the movement's arguments on policing. Ms. McDonald is a fellow at the Manhattan Institute, and her writings have appeared in a number of publications, including the New York Times, the LA Times, and the Washington Post, among others. She is also a frequent contributor on cable television. She is a lawyer by training, and her most recent book, The War on Cops, has stirred up some controversy and debate. This talk is sponsored by the Rose Institute of State and Local Government and the Salvatore Center. Finally, um, as someone who grew up in a country that does not protect free speech, coming to CMC has shown me how important I think free speech and discourse are and how closely I hold these values, regardless of your viewpoint. It's very awkward to be speaking to an empty room, but nevertheless, um, the show will go on. I would not work at the Athenaeum if I didn't believe these things. So um, with that, I'd like to remind you that audio and visual recording are strictly prohibited. Uh, please join me in welcoming Heather McDonald. Thank you, Ms. Sandbar, and thank you very much to the Athenaeum at Claremont McKenna College for inviting me and for not disinviting me. Uh, there's um, obviously a lot of controversy around speaking these days, and I hope it becomes a little less fraught at colleges. I've been hearing for the last two hours outside my window Black Lives Matter chants, so I assume that the students that are so committed to Black Lives Matter, put in the same amount of energy protesting when five-year-old Aaron Shannon Jr. was killed on, uh, on Halloween in 2010 when he was in his Spider-Man outfit outside of his house with a single bullet to his head by a member of the Kitchen Crips gang who also hit Aaron's grandfather and uncle. I hope as well that they put in a similar degree of protest when nine-year-old Tyshawn Lee in Chicago was lured into an alley with the promise of candy by a gangster disciples in November 2015 by an enemy of his father's gang and killed in cold blood. The original plan had been to chop off Aaron's fingers and send them to his mother. Aaron was one of 7,000 black Americans killed in 2015. I hope as well that the people protesting outside care about those black lives that were lost. But I know one thing for sure, the people who did show up at those 7,000 black murders were the cops. And I would suspect that if any of the members outside today had a loved one mowed down in gang violence, they would call the police. Now, for the last three years, this protest movement known as Black Lives Matter has convulsed the nation. Triggered by the police shooting of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, the Black Lives Matter movement holds that policing is systemically racist and that we are living through an epidemic of racially biased police shootings of black men. This belief has triggered riots and the assassination of cops. It has also led to a sharp drop off in proactive policing and a corresponding rise in violent crime. Even though the US Justice Department has resoundingly disproven the claim that a Pacific Michael Brown was shot in cold blood while trying to surrender, 
He continues to be treated as a martyr to police racism. Today I want to examine the Black Lives Matter movement's central thesis, that the police are the greatest threat facing young black men today. I'm going to propose two counter hypotheses. First, that there is no government agency more dedicated to the proposition that black lives matter than the police. And second, that we've been talking about phantom police racism for the last two decades in order not to talk about a far more difficult and uncomfortable problem, and that's black on black crime. Now let me state some core principles at the onset. First, cops have an indefeasible obligation to treat everyone they encounter with courtesy and respect and within the confines of the law. Too often, officers develop a hardened, obnoxious attitude towards the public. Second, every police shooting of an unarmed civilian is a stomach-churning tragedy. Police training has to work incessantly to prevent such grotesque miscarriages of justice. And third, given this country's appalling history of racism in betrayal of its fundamental ideals and the complicity of the police in maintaining slavery and de jure segregation through the use of brutal and unlawful force, every police shooting of a black man is particularly and understandably fraught. But however tragic the history of policing and race, patterns of policing today do not demonstrate racism. Contemporary policing is data-driven. In order to save lives, cops go where people are most being victimized, and that is in minority neighborhoods. To understand policing today, you have to look at the facts of crime. In 2015, over 7,000 blacks were murdered. That is 2,000 more homicide victims than the number of all white and Hispanic homicide victims combined, even though blacks are only 13% of the nation's population. Blacks of all ages are killed at six times the rate of whites and Hispanics combined. In Los Angeles, a typical city, Blacks between the ages of 20 and 24 die at a rate 20 to 30 times the national mean. Who is killing them? Not the police and not white civilians, but other blacks. The astronomical black death by homicide rate is a function of the black crime rate. Black males between the ages of 14 and 17 commit homicide at 10 times the rate of white and Hispanic male teens combined. The national black homicide rate is eight times that of whites and Hispanics combined and 11 times that of whites alone. This is based on Bureau of Justice Statistics data, the premier crime and policing data collection agency in the country within the Department of Justice. The police could end all use of lethal force tomorrow and it would have, at best, a negligible effect on the black homicide death rate. In fact, a much larger percentage of white and Hispanic homicide victims are killed by cops than black homicide victims. Fully 12% of all whites and Hispanics who die of homicide are killed by a police officer, compared to 4% of black homicide victims who are killed by a police officer. Cops are actually 18 and a half times more likely to be killed by a black male than an unarmed black male is to be killed by a cop. But homicide is not the only crime that is vastly racially disproportionate. New York City is representative of other crime spreads. Blacks are 23% of the city's population, but they commit 75% of all shootings and 70% of all robberies. How do we know this? This is what the victims of and witnesses to those shootings tell the police in their reports to police officers. Add Hispanic shootings to black shootings in New York City and you account for 98% of all illegal gunfire in New York City. Whites are 33% of the city's population, but they commit under 2% of all shootings and 4% of all robberies. 
These disparities mean that virtually every time that urban police are called to a shooting scene, they're being called to a minority neighborhood on behalf of minority suspects and being given the description of a minority on behalf of minority victims and being given the description of a minority suspect if anyone is cooperating. Officers do not wish this. It's a reality forced upon them by the reality of crime. Who are some of the victims of this elevated urban crime? In February this year of Chicago, an 11-year-old girl was sitting in a van and she was killed by a bullet to her head, shot by a 19-year-old drug dealer t peddling marijuana who was aiming at his rivals. He had a long criminal record. Of course, he was back on the streets. On Father's Day in Chicago this year, a three-year-old boy was shot in a drive-by shooting. He's now paralyzed for life. Tavon Tanner, a 10-year-old in Chicago, was playing outside of his home on Labor Day, gunned down in a drive-by shooting. The bullet ripped through his kidney, intestines, and spleen. In September 2015 in Cleveland, three children under the age of five were killed in drive-by shootings, leading the black police chief to say, everybody protests when the police kill one of us. Why doesn't anybody ever get on the streets when we kill each other? Cincinnati, July 2016, two young girls shot in drive-by shootings. One is now blind, the other is paralyzed. Police officers are more heavily deployed in high crime areas to stop just such carnage, using data to target shooting hotspots and responding to community requests for assistance. Now these crime disparities have enormous implications for police use of force. Police shootings are going to occur where cops most frequently encounter armed and resisting suspects and that is in, unfortunately, minority neighborhoods. Let's look at the data on fatal police shootings since that has been the focus of the Black Lives Matter movement. In 2015, cops nationwide killed 991 people, the vast majority armed and dangerous. There have been some horrific police shootings over the last three years, and they are deplorable. They include Walter Scott in North Charleston, Laquan McDonald in Chicago, but they are not representative. Every day, in just two-thirds of the nation's police jurisdictions, there are 23 deadly weapons assaults on officers. For every 10 deadly weapons assaults, the cops kill one person. Is that too high a ratio? I don't know. And nobody in the Black Lives Matter activist movement has ever suggested what a proper ratio should be. Now, among those 991 victims of fatal police shootings in 2015, 50% were white and 26% were black. You'd never know that, however, the white victims from the press coverage. Among the white victims was a 50-year-old man in Tuscaloosa, Alabama in a domestic violence incident who ran at the officer with a spoon, an unarmed 28-year-old driver in Des Moines, Idaho, Iowa, who led the police on a car chase, then walked quickly towards the pursuing officer, and a 21-year-old in Akron, Ohio, involved in a grocery store robbery who escaped on a bike and didn't take his hand out of his pocket when asked to do so. Had any of these victims been black, there's a good chance they would have become a national news story. But because they were white, they do not fit the dominant narrative about racist police shootings so they are wholly unknown. 26% of victims of fatal police shootings in 2015 were black. Does that indicate police racism? After all, it's twice as high as the representation of blacks in the national population, which is 13%. It does not. Police activity, whether stops, arrests, or shootings, should be measured against crime not population ratios. And those crime and victimization rates, as I previously discussed, are vastly disproportionate. Four studies came out last year alone showing that if there's a bias in police shootings, it works in favor of blacks and against whites. 
But however false the Black Lives Matter narrative, it has had an enormous effect on policing. Officers are increasingly encountering virulent hostility and resistance in the streets. When they get out of their cars to engage in a pedestrian stop, ask a few questions of somebody asking, acting suspiciously, they find themselves routinely surrounded by hostile jeering crowds, a little not quite as bad as this, but <laughs> I get the feel, uh, of people challenging their authority, sticking the cell phones directly in their faces. This fall, I was invited to address the fugitive task force of the US Marshals of New York and New Jersey. These are the guys who are tasked with apprehending the most violent felon absconders, people that even the big bad NYPD can't handle. And a black cop got up in the back of the room and said to me, I want to tell you what recently happened to me. He was trying to arrest a violent felon absconder in the North Bronx on White Plains Road. He found himself immediately surrounded by 23 people cursing at him. A guy picked up a pike and threatened to kill him. He only got out of there by calling for backup and two cops arrived. A Chicago cop told me he's never experienced so much hatred as his 19 years on the job. He said it's basically an undoable job now. Having been told that they are racist for engaging in proactive policing, the type of policing that actually prevents crime and not just react to it, that's pedestrian stops, low-level public order enforcement, cops are backing off. They're driving by that guy who's hanging out on a known drug corner at 1 a.m. hitching up his waistband as if he has a gun. An LA cop said guys and gals are telling each other in coffee shops, you'd have to be crazy to get out of your car and make that stop. You don't have to do it. Wait for the next 911 call after there's already been a robbery or a shooting victim. But don't put your career in jeopardy by engaging in that discretionary proactive stop. This isn't surprising. Policing is political. And when a vocal and highly influential segment of the population, such as the mainstream media, activists, academics, and until recently, uh, the White House and executive branch tell cops that they're racist for engaging in that type of proactive policing, we shouldn't be surprised if they back off. That's how it should work. There's recalibrating what the political taste is for it. But when officers back off of that type of proactive policing, crime shoots through the roof. 2015 saw the largest one-year increase in homicides in nearly half a century, 12%. In cities with large black populations, the homicide increase was even larger, ranging from 54% in Washington, D.C., to 73% in Milwaukee, to 90% in Cleveland, Ohio. I've called this double phenomenon of depolicing and the resulting increase in crime the Ferguson effect. And there's no better example of the Ferguson effect than Chicago. Police stops in 2016 dropped 82%. Last year, there were 4,300 shootings. That's one person shot every two hours. 24 children under the age of 12 were shot in Chicago last year. Now, because the overwhelming majority of those Chicago shooting victims were black, if you believe Black Lives Matter, you'd think, boy, those cops must have been really busy shooting all those black people. In fact, the cops in Chicago last year shot 26 people, virtually all armed or dangerous. That's 0.6% of all shooting victims. As a result of the, la of the large increase in homicides in 2015, over 900 additional black males were killed that year compared to the previous year. That is something we should be concerned about. That is something the Black Lives Matter movement must address. 2016 is likely to see an equally high number of murders, and this year is looking to be just about the same. Now, when cops back off, something else happens besides high crime. The many law-abiding residents of inner city areas 
find themselves ignored. I have never been to a police community meeting in a high crime neighborhood like South Central LA, South Bronx, or Central Harlem, Central Brooklyn, where I haven't heard some variant of the following request from the people in that room. You arrest the drug dealers and they're back on the corner the next day. Why can't you keep them off the street? There's hundreds of kids hanging out on the corner fighting. Whatever happened to loitering laws? Or there's kids in my lobby smoking weed and selling drugs. I'm terrified to go down and pick up my mail. I spoke to a woman, Mrs. Sweeper, an elderly cancer amputee in the Mount Hope section of the Bronx. She said to me, please, Jesus, send more police. As long as you see the police, everything is a-okay. But when she didn't see the police, she was a prisoner in her own apartment, unable to go down into her building lobby. I hear from people like an elderly woman in the 41st precinct of the South Bronx, who last June in a police community meeting, broke out spontaneously, apropos of nothing in particular, how lovely when we see the police. They are my friends. These are the people who are never heard in the national media. Now, when the police get these requests, these heartfelt requests for public order, I don't know what the activists expect them to do. The irony is that if they do respond to these requests to get the dealers out of the corner, off the streets, out of their lobby, they will generate the racially disproportionate activity data that can be used against them in the next racial profiling lawsuit. But if they don't respond, they are leaving those people to their own devices. The Baltimore consent decree that was signed in the waning days of the Obama administration is a perfect example of this. In August, a report came out of the Justice Department charging the Baltimore Police Department with systemic racism. And one of the practices that was routinely lambasted in this Justice Department report was the practice of clearing the corners of loiterers and trespassers. So this report came out, and a few weeks later, both the Baltimore Sun and the Washington Post sent reporters to West Baltimore. And they attended some police community meetings. And what did both these sets of reporters hear? from those good law-abiding people in West Baltimore, why aren't you clearing the corners? The drug dealers are back in control. I can't run my business, no employees want to come, and certainly no customers. Now, the violent crime increase of the last three years is putting at risk the crime drop of the last two decades that was accomplished thanks to proactive policing. Violent crime dropped 50% from 1994 to 2014 when the Black Lives Matter movement hit. It occurred thanks to a revolution in policing that began in the NYPD and spread nationwide. Until that point in 1994, police commanders in New York had no idea what the crime picture was and crime data was until six months after the fact. The people who took over the police department under Mayor Rudolph Giuliani and William Bratton said, this is completely unacceptable. We need up-to-the-minute crime data so we can work on strategies. They started gathering information fanatically, on a, first on an hourly, then on a weekly basis. And they were, would hold weekly meetings, and they'd call precinct commanders in, and they would grill those precinct commanders ruthlessly about crime in their precinct. And if those commanders didn't know every single shooting and every single robbery that occurred over the last month and weren't prepared with a strategy to end it, their careers were at jeopardy. These weekly meetings, which came to be known as CompStat, were high wire, high pressure events. Chairs were thrown immediately and careers were ended because the police had never before held themselves accountable. If you go to a CompStat meeting today in Los Angeles, New York, or Chicago, you're going to hear them talking about where are people being victimized? Where's the pattern of robberies? Where's the pattern of burglaries? They will never talk.
talk about race. The police are focused like laser beams in a CompStat regime on stopping crime. And they have saved thousands of minority lives since the early 1990s. But now that crime drop is at risk. In October of 2015, Chicago Mayor Rahm Emanuel met with U.S. Attorney General Loretta Lynch, and he told her, my Chicago cops have gone fetal. They're no longer willing to interdict crime. This is as a result of the Ferguson effect. But unless the false, false narrative about endemically racist policing ends, we're going to see more black lives lost. Cops need better training. They need better hands-on tactical training that will help them better make those agonizing split-second shoot-don't-shoot shoot decisions. They also need to be considered, but they also need to not be considered racist or demonized for simply enforcing the law where people are most being victimized. Nearly all police officers choose their careers out of a desire to serve, and a vast majority continue to believe fervently in the good people in the community who support them. By all means, we must do everything we can to make sure police departments use force only as a means of last resort. But as long as crime rates remain so disproportionate, policing will be more intense in minority neighborhoods, increasing the chances that when an encounter goes awry, it will have a minority victim. That's a tragedy, but it is one that will not change until crime rates change. If we could bring the black crime rate down to that of other groups, the alleged policing problem would go away and we wouldn't be having this conversation. And to do that, we need to reconstitute the family, which is dissolving all across the country. The best anti-crime policy is for boys to be raised by their fathers as well as their mothers. Rebuilding the family is a long-term project that requires a willingness to say unapologetically that children on average need fathers as well as mothers. In the meantime, however, proactive policing is the best government program yet devised to regenerate troubled urban neighborhoods and to free their law-abiding residents from the thrall of fear and disorder. Thank you for your attention, and I hope there's questions that have come in over the shouting. Thank you. So we will now be taking question and answer. Um, just to let everyone know who's uh, listening in on the live stream, you can email questions to athenaeum at cmc.edu if you would like a question to be read out. Um, so our first question comes from Michael, sorry, comes from Wes Edwards, and he asks, common sense police reform efforts advocated for by groups like Black Lives Matter, such as body cameras and community oversight boards, have been proven to benefit both police and civilians as they promote accountability on both sides and foster trust. How can these needed reforms be implemented when you paint any group calling for reforms as vehemently anti-police? I am not against body cameras. I think they're a, a wonderful innovation that will level the playing field between the cell phone camera videos that do not capture uh, the full encounter often between a police officer and a civilian. Officers these days are second guessing themselves. They're making up tactics on the fly that they weren't talk, taught in the academy uh, that don't look so bad, however lawful they may be. But officers are second guessing themselves. This, this uh, October, there was a car theft in Chicago and a car chase. And uh, after the car crashed, one of the passengers got out and started running, and the police caught up with him. And he grabbed a female Chicago police officer uh, and started beating her head into the pavement and pulling out large handfuls of her hair. He finally beat her unconscious. When she finally came to, uh, in the hospital bed, she told Chicago Police Superintendent Eddie Johnson that the reason she hadn't used her weapon, which she was clearly lawfully entitled to do, was she was so worried about being labeled the latest racist cop of the week. So police body cameras are necessary. They capture bad policing and good policing. 
Uh, and when they capture bad policing, as in the Walter Scott shooting and Laquan McDonald, those officers must be held accountable. The problem, the, the challenge with body cameras is they're enormously expensive. And it's not just the equipment, it's overall, above all, the storage uh, for, the, um, for the data, which is breaking department budget. So that's something we need to solve. Um, I am not against police reform, but I can tell you this. If one one hundredth of the energy that has been brought to bear against the police over the last two decades had been spent protesting outside the jail cells of people who kill blacks, we wouldn't be here today. Policing is an epiphenomenon of crime, and unless we can get the black crime rates down, uh, you're going to have police deployed more heavily in minority neighborhoods. I'm a CMC student. He says, Ms. McDonald, thank you for your talk this evening. I wanted to ask you a question about the type of proactive policing you advocated for during your talk. To me, profiling creates stereotypes from limited data that depersonalizes individuals, effectively stripping, them, uh, effectively stripping from them their individuality. How ethical do you think it is to act on these stereotypes? Uh, it's not. Police are uh, using their ob powers of observation and their knowledge of criminal behavior. I am not advocating profiling. What I am advocating is that when the police get requests from the community saying that this is a known drug corner, uh, that they respond. Are we finishing the talk? Okay, thank you. Thank you for Claremont McKenna. This has been a great privilege.